a point of irritation, I think, probably for a lot of Africans when they would travel, was the lack of understanding of what was going on on the continent. And that was not just with consumer goods. Like you say, yes, there was, uh, you know, to a certain extent with, you know, tourism, you know, people understand, you know, going you know, on safari and then and then if they really, you know, quite sophisticated, they might know about Cape Town and, and the beaches, but they didn't have any understanding of the, the sort of contemporary music that was coming out and the art and the, you know, and, and just the creativity on the continent. Now, you know, being able to be a part of putting a spotlight on that was, was really exciting. And like I've said a few times, it's really just showcasing what was already going on. And I think that also the world was very hungry to see that and to, to kind of learn about new, you know, dual evolutions, but different kind of realities. And also creating, I guess, what is a kind of a new heritage product. Welcome to Third Culture Africans, the lifestyle podcast for dreamers, thinkers, and doers. We celebrate artistry, share stories from those brave enough to create something and succeed, listen to diverse perspectives on African success, and those shifting the needle on culture. I'm Zezo Ariaki Sal, your host. On this week's episode of Third Culture Africans, my guest is Hanalee Rupert. She is a creative and an entrepreneur who loves to explore design and materials, and her work is focused on elevating African craftsmanship and highlighting local culture and curating that for the wider world. She's an incredible philanthropist and is a champion of social impact and doing that through her work and whether that's through creative arts or through entrepreneurship or creating a brand. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did sitting with Hanley and delving into her career and just the many hats that she wears. Thank you, Hannah Lee, for joining us on this week's episode of Third Culture Africans. Oh, thank you for having me. We were having a little chat offline before we came on about being digitally savvy. And we dare not repeat what you said. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm really not digitally, digitally savvy at all. Clearly. <laughs> but it's great to finally get you on the podcast. I, I think you were one of my first guests that I wanted on, but timings have have meant that it's taken us a, a few episodes in, but I think perfect timing actually, because so much has happened. We met, I want to say in 2009, I just arrived in Joburg and a mutual friend introduced us. And I think we were at the time, the f- first like young people to, to start sort of creating like proper businesses in sort of the South African scene from a consumer and luxury perspective of kind of locally made. Yes. And it was all about championing sort of African luxury and, and, and having that, I guess the benchmark be from a like global platform in terms of, or standard in terms of the quality and the, and the, and the story. Um, But you're a multi entrepreneur with your own accessories line or copy merchants on long, um, which is, has an incredible cult following. Um, I want to say the store with the golden touch, you have birthed so many successful fashion entrepreneurs and we'll we'll dive into that a little later, but you also have a must-see tourism destination, which is incredible and Africa's first concept store. Have you heard it put to you like that before? yet yeah I have I mean I I've, I think that's how we were kind of um described I I, de- I didn't give us that title but I find it very flattering I mean as you say we met in 2009 time really flies um crazy and at, you know a, a lot of people don't know that I actually sort of came up with the idea for a copy my brand um before merchants and I had sort of studied in, in London and then I lived in Europe. I was painting and, and I lived in Greece for a while. And then I moved back to South Africa with, with the idea in mind that I wanted to create this brand. I didn't have a name for it. Um, didn't, I didn't even know, I, you know, I would go specifically into leather goods. What I knew is I wanted to look at materials. I'm always quite drawn to organic materials. 
materials that I could find in South Africa and, and sort of surrounds um, and, and by working with them that it would have a net positive impact. So I started I, on this kind of, I guess, what became like a year long survey, um, sort of from late 2008 until about when I met you looking at that. And, and the first thing I started working was with was the springbok horn. And from that, it, it grew into multiple different avenues. And one of those things was that I discovered that there were at that point, not that many, but there were other brands who may be quite stylistically different, but, but had very similar ethos and they were, um, and really independent sort of tone of voice and, and authentic and, and exciting, but they weren't getting the exposure that they deserved. And, and so that's how I, I, I came up with the idea for Merchant Song Long, which is, I guess, kind of, uh, I mean, it is, you know, what it says it is the multi brand store, but for brands that are, authentically African made on the continent. And yeah, it's been 10 years now. I was at the Okapi launch. I remember. Yes, I was at the launch. And then I remember you speaking. I remember when Merchants Online came about and when you had, I think we had a conversation about you finding the space, but it being quite big and the idea of wanting to then incorporate other brands into the space and, and how that just evolved so beautifully to to what it is now you touched on briefly your painting career so I guess before this you went to the Wimbledon School of Arts and you got an arts degree in painting and then now turned multi-entrepreneur designer how did that happen was it just was it a new outlet for you or did you kind of wake up and go okay can I can I translate this into like, you know, designing goods? Well, I mean, first of all, I would say probably to say my painting career, to say career is quite lofty. Um, you know, well, I did. You did work in the gallery and, and you sit on the Tate International Council. Well, I did paint, you know, pretty, well, at the time I, I you know, painted for uh, uh, like maybe it was a year and a half, uh, uh, maybe two after university, pretty much full time and obviously interning and doing various jobs along the side. But, but it was in, going into fine arts was a very natural career direction for me I think from the age of about 14 I was probably quite difficult at school and that I was afraid refusing to do all of the subjects I, I, um, I should have been doing um, to better prepare me for then going into the more commercial world but I so I come from a family of a lot of artists um, and um, you know my grandmother my aunt you know, my mother taught art history and so it was it was a quite natural career path for me to go into into fine arts but um I did do a foundation where, you know, you try out different things. My mind was always set on painting. I think uh, probably, you know, it's not where my skill set necessarily lies. I'm much better uh, as a sort of draftsman and drawing. And after having studied and being alone in the studio for so long and then and then painting afterwards being even more so because I was, you know, living in Athens alone in my studio the whole time, I really wanted to do something that was working with other people. But it also became very important for me to, to do something that, like I said had a net positive good and, and and I've been interested in in the job creation side of it I think from the very start and so I wouldn't say I was drawn particularly by doing something in, in a kind of fashion context it was much more about the materiality of um, the products that I was making. I think that stood out to me in the beginning where it was it was more around the story and, and we'll delve into the part of you and a huge part of your work actually is is very much about using your influence and platform for the benefit of others. But I, I kind of want to dial back to early years. What was there something about that period of sort of navigating your creativity that allowed you to become who you are now? With the, with the clarity that you have? I mean, I would assume so because it, it, you have really, I mean, it's, especially in, in the kind of University of the Arts. I mean, wh when I was at Wimbledon, still our degrees weren't given by the University of the Arts. They are now, but you're given a lot of freedom to kind of contemplate. And a lot of it is about, you know, the concept of the work. And, and so they, I mean, and I think with any artist, however it manifests, there's a lot of soul searching, which I think if you um, go into a very structured career path and, um, and you're churning out a different type of work, maybe that 
that sort of inward looking process happens at a later stage when you have time. I'm sure it's happened for a lot of people now during COVID. You have time to actually reflect. Mm -hmm. And I guess that the reality of, of that time period is also knowing what is for you, right? Like I, I think it, it then forms in your mind clearly what what you know you 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 you're not that great at. Coming from a family of successful entrepreneurs and creatives, did you ever wrestle with sort of the expectation of choosing one or the other or having to become both? I think, you know, I was so naive when I went into it. I mean, you, I, I sort of left South Africa, you know, at 18 and came to London and and probably had, you know, overconfident and, and got sort of whacked down a lot for many years um, and then kind of learnt from the bottom up, which, and it came kind of full circle. Uh, I never contemplated going into a, a sort of different career path other than painting. It kind of just happened that way. That's so interesting because my impression of you is like a true artist. There's a very strong artistic part to how even you approach business and I think just merchants is a is a good reflection of that speaking of merchants you've used that platform really I I, I won't say you're almost like an incubator so you've got Laduma yeah I think you're one of the early supporters of Laduma with Makosa and uh, Tebe Magugu Rich Mincy um, and these guys have gone on to do incredible things in the fashion space from an Africa perspective globally. Is there something about doing that and being at the forefront of fashion? You know, business of fashion has highlighted you several times as shaping the African fashion scene and your business of fashions, 500, et cetera. But where did that part of your story or, or or the journey come into it where it was very conscious or even just being able to see before the world sees the talent? I mean, Ludum is a good example because, you know, he's, we, we've really been stalking him from the very beginning. And in many ways, merchants and, you know, some of these brands, it was kind of a parallel evolution. And we were just lucky in that we, we could be there um, as a stockist and, you know, sort of, I think one of the big things, I mean, is, is being able to purchase outright so the designers can get cash flow, which is really a problem, um, for young designers and, and, and especially in South Africa where the market is quite capped. But it's also been interesting because, you know, in 2000 and, you know, 10, when we first opened doors, this world focus on African design was just sort of beginning. And we had the Football World Cup and our timing was, we were very, very, um, serendipitous with that. Beyond timing, I think, you know, you're so modest in saying, um, you know, purchasing um, outright instead of the concession model, which is which is a huge challenge in the African space for any young designer or brand. And, you know, from a brand perspective, I'm sure you've also faced this with Okapi, where people in the beginning are looking for consignment relationships as opposed to, you know, taking the risk and then wearing the hat of a retailer and and not doing that to brands, but at the same time, really using your platform, you know, you're taking these brands on and in, in a huge way, harnessing them and, and really helping them project to where they need to be. You know, I remember you really sort of being a champion of, 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 you know, Luduma and Makosa, as with Tebe, and, and just with constantly finding ways to highlight the talent out of Africa. So, you know, I think it's modest to say that you were only just purchasing. You were doing a lot more than that. I think one of the things which is really exciting with that, you know, the African designers and with these designers in particular, and the, you know, what I look for in the brands and or have looked for is, is an authentically African voice that's coming up with something new. So it's not kind of like adding an African pastiche to something that's already been done in a European context. It's really speaking with, with a new voice. Um, and it's, I think a lot of these things speak, you know, first primarily to their audience and their market. And then if it's picked up by a global audience, that's great and that's cool. But um, 
but it, it, it's really looking at things from a, from a different lens. And and through that, then you know the clothes or the products start to to mean a lot more. And I think for all of us that came out at, at around the same time, I think it was the first time in the African space and also globally where as entrepreneurs, as brand owners, as creators, and in some cases, creatives, we had already seen iterations of people trying to follow the European model too closely or people sort of taking themselves out of the market or the race completely. And we had the unique opportunity to brand Africa in products that made it accessible to the world. And the timing of the World Cup in 2010 was such a great opportunity to be able to show that to the world. I I don't know if you felt that with Okapi and with merchants, like just, it was, it was almost like the world decided to look and somehow we were saying what the world wanted to see or hear in terms of just authenticity and, and something new. And it wasn't about novelty, which was, I think, a path that, that had been walked for a very long time. It was very much about creating a new voice um, that was representative of all the influences. Was that something you felt or you just kind of were just going along and it happened? <laughs> no. I mean, I think it definitely it was. It was such an exciting time, and it, and it, it was very much that. And I mean, obviously, you know, such a huge continent, so many different voices, so many different design inspirations. But there was a kind of commonality between it, and and even you know, as far apart as you know, because we stock brands from all over the continent, and you know, there there was something maybe you know, obviously very different, like in in terms of you know, aesthetically, in the in the different prints, in the different you know, genetic makeup of the brands. But but the ethos that the designers held was very similar and really something in the, in the manufacturing and, and just the making of the products and what the products stand for is, is similar, I think, across the continent. This podcast is sponsored by Malay Natural Science. Malay's products are inspired by the rich landscapes, alluring scents and ancient wisdom of Africa. Their luxurious fragrance and body care range balances 100% natural active ingredients and scientifically proven formulas to heal, protect, and pamper your skin. Malay ships worldwide, and you can buy their products at maleeonline.com. They also offer a free sample if you'd like to try. I always remember the early days as being young and restless, and there was there was a huge part of ignorance um, that was really bliss. Because I think if I knew then what I know now in terms of just the reach and the message, I'm not sure if I would have tackled as many things as I did just from the fear of it, right? Like, I think there was a part of us just kind of being passionate about the creation and having your product out and having the opportunity to affect people from an economic standpoint, because you could really see firsthand what, how many lives or families and economic opportunities you created with just creating a product. It was so clear. And I think you and I had a few sort of sustainability and supply chain conversations with Okapi and you know, you then delving into the supply chain the way you did. And I think it's something, it's it's one of these things that actually is, it's really a global issue. And alongside this conversation about, you know, African design, which is, you know, obviously, you know, in, in the African creative economy, and it's at the forefront of everyone's mind across the world, sustainability is at the same time. And, and I think the rest of the world has a lot to learn from us in terms of tracing back supply chains and and how products come to be. And, and it's really something, you know, that African sort of, I guess, designers and and, uh, manufacturers can teach to other people. And there's definitely something about Africa's slow fashion and consumption culture that is beautiful to see, especially in the time now where the world is looking back on sustainability. And, you know, in the early days, you invested a lot in skills training 
for a copy within your supply chain. And that was a pride point for you. You know, we do a sort of fair amount of the work in-house and then and then um, also work particularly, you know, with the leather, with incredible manufacturers who uh, have built the, the entire company. The cornerstone of it is the skills training and the people who make up the product. And I think people feel that it's um, it. And, and that ties in, I, I think, it's centrally to the idea of slow fashion and rather owning, you know, a, a, a small number of pieces that you really care about um, than than sort of you know, this like buy now, throw away culture. Was there something about the investment in other people's skill sets though that, because, you know, one thing I found with every guest on the show is, you know, everyone's work isn't just about putting out the product, right? Like it's not just about making money and the product. I think in context, it's very much about the people that you're hoping to serve but for you, was that conscious, like right at the forefront when you, you, you sort of decided to tackle a copy and, and you said, you know what, for me, the goal is about empowering as many people as possible? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I think that was really the primary goal. So, so funnily enough, I don't think many people know this way. So, I told you I did this sort of year-long process of of um, of kind of investigating d- different avenues of manufacturers and um, materials to work with. So. One of the first things I did with a copy, actually, before even working with leather, was started working with uh, through through a charity in South Africa called the Comfort Bantu. Starting work with, working with a group of senior women doing crocheting um, from plastic. So I was working with in the city kind of kids who were collecting plastic bags that we then went through a cleaning process. So we were doing a, and a crocheting project with these senior ladies. Um, and um, and then the, the kind of recycled plastic became crochet hats and then um, sheets that we then sort of translated into bags. But just, you know, the kind of sheer, I guess, volume of of sort of work in in creating this production line made it that that the end price point of each bag was so unsustainable that trickle down you know in terms of job creation was going to be so small <laughs> like and 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 there was no market for it and so i had a choice at that point to either you know do something that you know was logistically sort of borderline impossible to get it to the to the consumer in the end but had arguably one of the most brilliant stories of a product of all or i could go down a kind of more um a structured and, and sort of streamlined manufacturing process and um and create more I, I think truly sustainable jobs and so i chose the latter and we do do a lot of projects now you know now that i've created the structure for it with really more grassroots um groups so for example like we have you know our, our springbok horns where we work with zen sulu and we have the sulu wire weaving around them i'm happy with that rather than sort of doing a one-off piece here and there and really not being able to support the future of it but there's something about the highlighting of the craftsmanship that is unique to your work whether it's in okapi or in merchants on long and being able to put that at the fore and also demand what craftsmanship means in terms of quality, price, place, positioning. Absolutely. For you, and and this is a question actually I've always wanted to ask you because that's always stood out to me. And by and large, we take it for granted as practitioners in the space. But for you, you never have. You've always wanted to make that clear. I think it probably comes across in in a lot of the designs and a lot of the collaborations we do with Okapi. I am passionate about craft, and and I think with with what I was doing with with Okapi and and with merchants, it was also giving allowing these African crafts to be elevated to a, a really global platform where they could, you know, be showcased alongside what we traditionally will see, you know, in in Europe as as kind of heritage crafts. And it's interesting, you know, the crafts evolve as a, a sort of byproduct of the environment, which I find very interesting. It's, it's similar to like slow food movement. It's, you know, if, if you look at crafts, it's, you know, they're, they're so of their place and of the materials that surround them. It's kind of like eating foods in season. And I think the world is turning that way and, and really appreciating, you know, the work that goes into these products. You touched on something earlier around your sort of choice of materials and and sort of fishing around right like 
before you settled on final concept of a copy and, and, and exploring different materials, you launched a copy at the time where there was, you know, a huge shift in traditional consumer culture, right? So it was all about moving away from skins and now into, you know, synthetic alternatives. But your view on your choice of remaining in the same sort of path where it's about skins and your choice of skins is very interesting. Do you mind sort of sharing a little bit more about that? No, I, I'm happy to share about it. I think, you know, and I, I really do reevaluate it constantly. And, you know, I've gone through through periods where, where um, you know, I sort of have been like vegetarian, vegan for months. And, uh, you know, how I feel about working with skins is that I work primarily with byproduct um, of the food industry. And, um, and the main skin I work with is ostrich. It's, I think, it's been described globally as an exotic skin, but in South Africa, it's not considered exotic because it's an exotic animal to us. Yeah, which is crazy, right? I think people have to see it like that and kind of inverse their opinions on things. And and, and you, you should really, you know, trust local cultures and, and listen to their side of the story. And, and so ostrich is a great example. It's an incredibly labor-intensive animal to work with and to farm and, and really impacts people all along the food chain, you know, from when they're little tiny hatchlings, they they have sort of to hire the, the gogos, the grannies from the community to babysit them, to keep them apart so that they don't fight. You know, they're an incredible meat source. It's very, very light carbon footprint. I think, you know, it's something like 200 times X lighter than, than beef. And every single, you know, there's zero waste when it comes to this product. And so it supports entire communities in South Africa. And it was really looking at that, that, it, that beyond just the natural aesthetic beauty of the product that got me inspired by, you know, working with it as a skin. What would you say then for you has been, because you're unique in the sense that you're on both sides of the equation, right? So you're on the retailer side of the equation, and then you're also on the brand side of the equation of luxury goods in Africa. What would you say the, like for you, the pros and cons have been? Because I think in the early days, I would hear a lot of how are you going to compete? There isn't a market for this, or there's no space globally for this. And, you know, we've all been able to prove that wrong, but I guess your perspective on on the pros and cons of producing luxury goods in Africa. You really have to, I guess, know your market and and be on top of it. It's, it's you know, and have a very strong team on the ground because, like anywhere in the world, um, you know, quality control is so key. But it, you know, South Africa is it's just geographically quite far removed. So if you're looking at a global market and you're trying to sit with one foot in, in Europe or America, one foot in South Africa, I think logistically it can, it can be quite difficult. So investing in, in a really strong team and HR, you know, locally it has been you know, fundamental to me. And I'm so lucky that I have such a wonderful team in Cape Town and Johannesburg now. And, uh, you know, how, you know, things, sort of you know the retail side in South Africa is, is so tricky because it's so impacted so heavily by tourism and so I think it's really important to have both so that you can kind of you know if you have a really bad season one year you know kind of can balance out with you know your global market and um and yeah it, it's kind of start to work a lot I mean zoom is no it's nothing new for us yeah well for us as practitioners no but for I think the question maybe might be, would you create a supply chain again from scratch? Ah, it's a very, very different <laughs> prospect, I think, now to what it was 10 years ago. Um, so yeah. I think one of the key components of, of many of our products, which is is the leather, you know, was an existing manufacturer that I started working with. And um, and from there, we've built out, like, really, it's a lifestyle brand. So having to track down those existing uh, manufacturers and suppliers and work with it and, and and that's probably, what, you know, I'd say one of the most exciting things about the brand building. And it's recognizing that existing talent. And so, yeah, I, I love that part. You do it again? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I, I enjoy that. I, I think um, it, it's... Uh, you're a sucker for the pain. <laughs> <laughs> Can you remember the first, like, 
the first moment where something turned up that was nothing like what you expected? I mean, <laughs> I, so the, as I, I mentioned earlier, the Springbok horns, you know, it's kind of the, I guess, the icon of a copy. And, um, and I started thinking about it because I was like, these things are so beautiful and, and they're literally thrown away. Um, as we get ours from butchery and, and kind of started working with that. I mean, that was like 2008 to get it into, well, you know, just the, the soldering and, and kind of, you know, the metalwork and to get it, I mean, with, with the, the Zulu wire weaving to where it is now from the sketch, the original sketches that I did in 2008, it probably took, you know, five years. So I, I think I have the first, the first versions and, <laughs> and then I have, I have the first versions of both, both directions actually. Cause I think I, 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 at the launch, um, I got the first Zulu, the horn. And then when you introduced the weaving, I think when you, you just launched and you did that pop up in Chelsea. Oh, um, yeah, in Walton Street. On Walton Street, yes. And you had just introduced with the weaving on 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 the horns, and I and I got one then. So oh, um, fantastic. I think I've I've collected at pivotal times <laughs> different <laughs> um sort of yeah iterations of the of, of the horn i'm waiting for the third the third leap in the in the horn's evolution yeah it's true we, no we... actually you did a third you did a third you did a third with with um with um precious stones you did a third but we i do I... have a fine jewelry yes. um range which we launched last year which is i guess the third iteration yeah but, you, uh... you did the third i'm i'm not i'm i'm not yet uh, liquid enough for the third <laughs> that in itself <laughs> took a lot of R and D um, and product development. It's it's always, yeah, it's always very labor intensive. But it's beautiful to see you take something that sort of traditionally has so much meaning, like the horn, and and from a spiritual perspective and a traditional perspective, and and create out of it value, right? Like who would have considered putting diamonds on a springbok horn and having that be a statement piece and and also a, a clear communication in in the value of that piece. I, I think with so much urbanization and modernization, basic things like the weaving, even just finding end products now in Africa is hard. Like there's now so much scarcity around those things I, I don't know if you're 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 feeling that now also like just navigating wanting to fuse some of the heritage and traditional elements into sort of creating the end result that is based around craftsmanship and 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 what luxury really is but in the mainstream arena that it's just not in the same way I, I don't know if you're finding that I think, you know, with a lot of the brands and, and, um, and this is where, you know, we, we try and help at merchants and, and I think, it, you know, especially when, when brands aren't liquid, it's like they can get to 90%, but then, then they fall short at the last 10%, which is just like the final sort of adding that like sort of touch on it. But it, it's that 10% that, that really is what elevates it into being a world class product. And so, you know, the majority of the work is what comes in that handcrafted, you know, whether it's the weaving things, but, you know, to put it on a platform, whether it's, it, you know, just adding, you know, that the, the little tiny gold hook or, or you know, the, the silk pouch comes in, it, it, it's, it's really pivotal for the brand. Mm. And, and the little things make such a huge difference in terms of the communication, because I feel like the story, and I don't know if you've, you've, you've felt this with Okapi and even with merchants, the story is so big and so vast that even just narrowing that down enough so that it's in small enough chunks for the market to understand. And, 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 I, and I think as, as Africans, we have such rich culture that translating that into a product can sometimes be the biggest challenge. Yeah, I think you're right. You really need to, to, to remain focused because, and 
like it's, it's a huge rich culture that I mean it expands over a whole continent and no one brand can own that and and I think in the early days and there were sort of these emerging designers and, and getting so much attention so you know I think people did want to kind of try and own the entire story but it's not for any one brand or, or creative or retailer to own and in fact it only becomes more interesting when it's layered and and you start to you know like with anything learn about the differences and the nuances between the designs and and the origins and so i mean with okapi like our our sort of like storyline is, is is very i would hope straightforward <laughs> And constantly kind of trying to refer back to that, which is like, you know, the origins of the material, the inspiration from nature, the kind of design codes that I, I guess I originally laid out for the brand, which, you know, like I, I say design codes coming from nature. And a lot of that is, you know, very much about, I mean, if, if you looked at art movements, probably you would say like art, art nouveau. And I, I'm quite drawn to symmetry. And I mean, you find so much symmetry within nature and then that reflects back into into you know heralding the, the kind of or, or trying to like uplift the organic material to be the the central focus of the product i think it would be amiss if if you know we don't mention the fact that you come from i guess your dad is a successful luxury goods industry entrepreneur with richmond but has that influenced you in any way Certainly, because you grow up in an environment where, I mean, that's the, the focus of our conversations. And similarly, like in any family, if you grow up and, and you're surrounded by doctors, you're naturally going to be have an interest um, in medicine. And so I was very lucky and fortunate to grow up with, I guess, a, a deeper understanding than most of of what it, it sort of takes to to develop a luxury brand, what consumers might be looking for. And I guess this kind of duality mm -hmm. between an understanding of Africa and um, and then understanding luxury in a global context was hugely important. And But it's often, you know, it's blind to you until much later that, that you're exposed to that. But you tackled it so differently, though. Like, you're, yes, the influence exists, but your approach to it was taking something that, by and large, for a long time, the world didn't put luxury in Africa in the same sentence, especially when it came to, to consumer goods. You would get it in travel, especially sort of, you know, curated travel around, you know, safari and, and, and sort of travel nature. But for a long time, there was no association with Africa and luxury consumer goods. And tackling that was huge. Like you could have easily gone down the route of creating something completely known and understood because you had enough of a reference point, but you chose to tackle something completely different. Like how did that feel pushing out of the shadow of your heritage? I think, I, like, and it's probably something and it, more so, I mean, intensely more so 10 years ago, there was a point of irritation, I think, probably for a lot of Africans when they would travel, was the lack of understanding of what was going on on the continent. And that was not just with consumer goods. Like you say, yes, there was, a, you know, to a certain extent with, you know, tourism, you know, people understand, you know, going you know, on safari and then and then if they really, you know, quite sophisticated, they might know about Cape Town and, and the beaches, but they didn't have any understanding of the, the sort of contemporary music that was coming out and the art and the, you know, and, and just the creativity on the continent. Now, you know, being able to be a part of putting a spotlight on that was, was really exciting. And like I've said a few times, it's really just showcasing what was already going on. And I think that also the world was very hungry to see that and to, to kind of learn about new, you know, dual evolutions, but different kind of realities. And also creating, I guess, what is a kind of a new heritage product. Before we, we, we talk about, I guess, the philanthropic side of your work, let's talk about your DJing career. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very, very short lived. You really can delve in deep. I had to. I had to. <laughs> um, that was very short lived. 
Um, although I, I did get, constantly get asked to DJ, like I mean, I don't, I don't even actually know how to turn tracks. I mean, I, I think connecting an iPod, like we just at the beginning of this, we started with talking about how uh, my lack of techno- <laughs> technological savvy. I think if my brother listens to this podcast, he's going to die. Um, so yeah, no, uh, I, I, but I, I do love music, and I, I think I have a very like a. Um, maybe shallow knowledge of a very broad um sort of like like taste in music so i mean I, one of my favorite I, I had things to with the dj <laughs> <laughs> well, i mean one of my favorite things when i started merchants really really favorite things was um was making the playlists for the shop mm, i love um, that too actually it, there was because there were so many exciting things. It wasn't just in design. I mean, on the music side, like it was uh, so many exciting things happening on on the continent. On you the know, continent, um, yeah, I agree. And, and I still have the soundtrack to that period in my head, and it's like bringing you know all those different elements together was great. Yeah, I, I always used to say that the best part about owning the Malay retail store was being able to just vomit everything I wanted creatively visually sonically beyond the product it was just a great way of just getting it all out and actually funny enough um last month i got a i got an email from an ex-employee asking me for the store playlist um, oh, how cool. because 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 they wanted the playlist and you know those are the days where you would sit and really curate playlists on itunes right totally and then, <laughs> well i can um, say that definitely that would not have happened with the, with the merchant staff because we had this i mean this one playlist with this guy i think Mzungu Kitcha was his name and mm. i mean everyone was so <laughs> thoroughly sick of this playlist of it. it was kind of like having christmas songs um yeah, you know it was just, just played it. so often I, I actually, I'm going to compile it, compile it on Spotify and I'll send it I to you. I think you should. I yeah. think you should. I need to listen to it. I, I, the only thing I remember is just being hit with um, when the, the bill for the, the guys who do the copywriting for the music and you had to pay like a subscription in order to be able to um, play, play the, the music. I didn't even know that. Oh God, and well, this was long in. before we were that we we were sort of that professional. And, I was like, in a mall, remember? That. So for me, oh, it was a bit different. And so one day, they're like, "Oh, a man came in." I'm like, "What man?" And they're like, "This man came in, and he says he's from some some board or whatever, and about playing the music." And apparently, we have to pay like a license to be able to play all this music. I was like, no. At first, I thought it was like, you know, like a scam, you know, because this is Africa. We can play whatever we want. But no, actually, I paid a license to be able to play um, play music um, in the store. And is that what that's I, what people hilarious. just put on the radio? Yes, that's why some people in stores put on the radio because if you play music, you pay a license um, to be able to play all that music, which. On the one hand, I thought it was great because I hoped that the artists would get revenue as a result. I guess that's what royalties are made up of, right? Like, I hoped that the artists exactly. would, get, would get something in, in, in return. But for sure, it, that definitely hit me like a ton of bricks. And I was like, another bill? What? <laughs> and then I considered not playing any music. But the point was to kind of immerse people into this experience and you've done it so beautifully with merchants where it's a real sort of destination and it's an experience to be able to shop the best of the continent's luxury goods in one space i must say it's crazy that malay has never been in merchants but i don't even know why we've never done it i have no idea I mean, we've got um, we've got to do it, and we've got to do an event yeah. um, together. There, yeah. would be fantastic. But I have no idea why why we've never done it. Like it makes no I sense. I think you know um, we kind of. I know we didn't start like this because I mean you'll remember when we first opened, we really it was a, a much more a concept store in the in the true sense. I mean we used to work with um, Stevenson Gallery and you know, had like a, a much um, deeper sort of involvement in the arts and and Space, actually, yeah. you know sort of. Um, design on on a kind of you know bigger scale in terms of um, you know bigger products of furniture pieces and then and then after we sort of opened Southern Guild really took off and and they kind of 
captured that whole area and then the, you know you, you doing kind of really skincare we became focused so um heavily on fashion fashion yeah and then I started doing a lot in hospitality and then I don't think we just it just never came up in conversation it was just never and it's odd actually because I was thinking about it and I thought why haven't we worked together like I couldn't think of a reason why but I digress young global leader world economic forum Imibala, all the philanthropic stuff that you do, that comes from just the heart of you. I say that because I, I know you and just I know how important that work is for you. Where are you with that? You know, I think we had we had dinner when I want to say last year, just before Christmas. Where are you with all of that? And and you were working on something then can you speak on it here or I, I can so I've kind of the past couple of years been going back into working I guess more directly with fine arts and I started working we have a family museum in Stellenbosch I started working with it two years ago and the first project was really looking at the existing building and um, and doing a physical refurbishment but the, the sort of facelift phys- physical refurbishment of the building was actually um all done in order to make it more accessible to the immediate community and I guess the ethos is very similar to this project to what I've kind of been trying to do with merchants and and a copy and, it, and it's trying to reach people through you know I guess a creative community and um, and to give access and, and in this case kind of really educate through the existing um, collection of works that we have there but, uh, but the whole space and um, and I've been drawn to the idea of rather than, um, you know, and, and with this looking at uh, kind of acquiring works and having what is quite a traditional trajectory of, of, um, of you know, buying a piece from maybe a sort of museum, um, a fair or um, a dealer and then sort of hanging it on the wall and... Um, and looking at actually how we can make a museum without walls and rather support um, the creative communities and uh, not only to create, you know, sort of products like that, but actually to come up with ideas. Um, and so started something which will hopefully, I think, become a bit of a legacy project for the museum. And it's really simply put called the Social Impact Arts Prize. So we went, sort of launched it during the Joburg Art Fair, it's like, year and a half ago and then did a bit of a road show around around the country and in Namibia as well and just sort of speaking to people about what it is and so simply put it was open call anyone could enter we really I'm really interested in the intersection between you know different I guess practices so whether it's artists working with architects or engineers or scientists coming together with creatives to problem solve. And so we got over a hundred entries and I'd say, you know, over 95% of them were of, of groups of people working together. So we saw exa- exactly that come to life, which was so exciting and whittled that down to a short list of, of six winning or six groups of winning finalists. And so they got a stipend to create what went on ex- exhibit in the museum, which was a really a proposal to win this residency program and within the residency then realize and, and, and build or, or put together their project that they'd entered with. And so it is all site specific. It's all going to kind of take place in this town called Krafrenet, which is in the semi desert in South Africa. It's about eight hours drive from Cape Town, eight hours from Johannesburg. And um, a lot of people ask me why I chose this town. So it's it's very special to me in that my late grandfather was born there and he's from there. But moreover to that, it's it, the topography of it is incredibly unique. It's it's really one of the most beautiful, still, soulful places in the world, and and I think really the ideal place for any sort of residency where you can sort of sit like I was saying earlier and reflect and look back and kind of figure out what your place is in this world and hopefully if you know if through this social impact arts prize how you can really use your skills for the greater good of of mankind and so we had an incredible sort of group of judges who came together who are not really just judges that really become like an advisory board for the um, arts prize but also for then the entrance and so really they have a strong um, sort of sounding board to lean off and springboard from and so we had the the kind of I guess the judging right before the lockdown and that was really really you know a wonderful uplifting and exciting moment and now we're just looking at um, how to to sort of make the, these, these the winners really realize and finalize their projects so I mean I can tell you a little bit about them it's quite exciting so 
one of the winners created something called Hello Volk, which means high cloud. And um, so the Karoo has been in drought. For, in Afrikaans, right? Exactly. Um, as the crew's been in drought for many years now. Um, ironically, just when the finalists went there, we had like huge amounts of rain. But they created which what means is, which is blessings actually in South African culture. R- rain rain very is meant much. to signify blessings. But so they created this. I guess it's a virtual cloud in that it, it will will give out free data, but it's also a physical cloud. But I think you know, as as I said, like we're working closely with um, with the judging panel, and it will evolve and and um, as it gets built, that's why it, it's you know these were the proposals and the outcome, but the outcome will change you know along the course of the residency. So it it shared it, it you know the sort of. Um, w- there was a fully audited judging process and and we came up with exactly total tie draw two winners. And the other one that won was really a performance. And so sort of, it was a mix of, you know, creatives and choreographers and musicians who who came up with the idea was what their idea was to look at these existing choir groups in this town of Grafrenet. So I, working with um, people from all different sort of ethnicities and backgrounds and um, socioeconomic groups to come together and do this mass choir performance in the town square. And obviously with COVID, that's kind of uh, the, the plan of how to realize it is, has changed, but I think potentially will be even more exciting. And it was kind of all of, all of these, residencies are kind of in, in the in the sort of first stages now so check back in in a couple of months and then and and i think it'll be it'll be really important for people to be able to really have something more tangible and understand what the prize is about and like yeah so what we're doing with that and that's been really yeah an exciting project kind of working on for the past two years speaking of covid <laughs> <laughs> the words grief loss come to mind are you guys open now at Merchants? We are. We, we, we're more by appointment. Um, mm. But um, South Africa actually opened up quite a, a while quickly. before the UK. Yeah. Mm. Pretty quickly. Um, and I think people are being, from what I can tell, very, very responsible in South Africa. Everyone's wearing their masks. Um, yeah. And, um, and the desire to get back to work in South Africa was mm. immense. Huge. Huge. Yeah, I, I I remember having to apply for the for the certificates to allow for the critical um, businesses and having to do that quite early on, just in order for us to to continue production. Good thing I make soaps and creams for a living because we 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 didn't struggle too much. But I, I think from a business perspective, seeing your work on all fronts, right, in, in terms of equipment, etc. I think COVID's hit a huge, has impacted hugely, I think, um, the creative community and I guess finding a a new way of reaching more people and creating awareness sounds to me like your third baby is in creative cultural arts. I've predicted it (laughs) and I look forward to seeing that unfolding. I don't know, what, what are you doing to kind of weather the the COVID 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 storm, as it were. I wouldn't call it pandemic. I'm over the word pandemic. I mean, I, I guess it's it's different, kind of personally, professionally, you know, and as a creative, because I think for creatives, you know, having this time to to look inwards and and for you know get off the hamster wheel has been you know hugely beneficial. I hope that the world also wakes up and realizes. I mean, so my co-director on the Social Impact Art Prize, um, Rulof van Veek, told me recently that he read somewhere that I think. I think was a Singapore did a study of you know essential services and they voted the creative communities the least essential service and he was saying you know how ridiculous and how short-sighted this is that people don't realize every single form of entertainment that people had during lockdown was through creative services I mean the books you were reading Netflix I mean everything the music you were now. listening to to improve it, your mood exactly and I really hope that not everyone kind of is that short-sighted and that people start to actually place more value on the importance of it, it's difficult because it's intangible you know so so even with the social impact art prize it's like how do you what how do you measure social impact and and how do you measure the benefit of um creative communities but but we are getting there i think south africa you know you know sort of waking up to it and um and realizing that that you know just in in terms of you know something as as sort of an easier touch point as tourism like we were saying earlier people would just think about safari and beach but now we're seeing huge swathes of tourists who are coming to try and understand the creative 
to um, sort of communities of Africa. And, um, and you know, I think hopefully it, it, it just continues in that direction. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the next 10 years and the evolution thereof. Hopefully we're, we're all still in the industry and, and helping to continue to, to open and, and break down as many doors as possible to see other people flourish. Um, I, I think we're, we're definitely in the work you've done with a copy of Merchants is, is, has been pioneering and hopefully you hear it enough to understand the impact you've made and the value you've brought to sort of the luxury industry in Africa. That's very kind of you to say. <laughs> Where can people find you? <laughs> on social media, on the internet, a copy, merchants. Where can you be found? A copy, yeah, it's uh, the handle at a copy Africa and um, social impact arts prize. Similarly, <laughs> simple, straightforward, social impact arts prize. Um, yeah, merchants at merchants on long. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Zeta. That was really, uh, really inspiring and uplifting hour. Thank you. I hope you you gave all the inspiration. I I was just <laughs> I was just here soaking all soaking it all in. Uh, thank you so much for joining us in this week's episode of Third Culture Africans. Oh, thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Third Culture Africans, the Lifestyle Podcast. We would love to hear from you. So please find us on Facebook or Instagram at Third Culture Africans and leave us a comment. A review goes a long way in getting our show notice. So please leave us one if you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you next time. Third Culture Africans.